it's hard to put put a finger on, you know, the day that everything changed. You make that next decision to do something different. This is Martha's Vineyard, an island off the coast of Massachusetts divided into six towns. It's 20 miles long from Chappaquiddick to Gayhead. The island's one high school is in Oak Bluffs. There's no bridge to the mainland, so most arrive via ferry in Tisbury. Along with the bustling Edgar Town, these form what's called Down Island. And the more rural western section is Up Island. There are just 17,000 year-round residents, but every summer 100,000 tourists visit their community, an ebb and flow in which their community has become dependent. Springs like this, a little warmer sometimes, a little colder sometimes. Summer's a madhouse. Fall starts uh, settling back again. We get beautiful days like this. We also get some uh, nor'easters, which uh, tend to howl. Between the bustling, visitor-filled summers, both the born and raised islanders and the wash ashores find themselves on a much quieter island, and many earn their living during this absence of tourists, when both customers and co-workers are simply neighbors. A lot of people don't get to see this end of it. This is when we sneak around to get this stuff done, so come summertime, they can, uh, they can tie up their boats and everybody can have a nice time. The island is tight-knit. It's hard to be nobody, and it's easy to be somebody. Take Stanley Larson. The Larson name is one that every islander knows. It's where I grew up, right here. One that dates back to before the island was known as a playground for presidents, Hollywood directors, middle-class vacationers, and instead for generations of fishermen dependent on the sea. Throughout the 19th century, long after European colonists descended upon the native Wampanoag people, fisheries and whaling fueled the island's economy. But it was in 1835 and today's Oak Bluffs when the early infrastructure for tourism began to form, a type of Protestant gathering known as camp meetings were the island's first organized attraction. And it was the visitors of these early events that would eventually form the Oak Bluffs Association, establish waterside lots and roads, and open the island's first hotel in 1868. But the island isn't a homogenous sprawl of quaint cottages and ancient cliffs. Like anywhere in America, there are class lines. Some live paycheck to paycheck. Others live in retirement. There are music venues, gift shops, dive bars, and school sports. And like everywhere in America, there's a population struggling with substance use disorder. This film will follow several permanent residents of the island who have either struggled with addiction, devoted their lives to helping others with recovery, or more commonly, both. It was just such a beautiful place to live. It was just a, a very carefree life. I think pretty much everybody on the island has been touched by some, some form of substance abuse. Those things start small. I think one of the first people I narcan I, I knew the kid pretty well. It's, you know, it's pretty prevalent. It's sad. It stands out here because you look at this island in the summertime and it seems like, how could that be possible? In the wintertime, yeah, it's still wonderland. We still love it, right? But it's, uh, it's so easy to fall to that because there's, there's runs out of things to do. Start partying on payday and, you know, by Monday they're out of money and go back to work for four or five days and then every year it gets a little bit more intense. A fertile ground for other substances. I remember just driving from end of the island to end of the island when I was younger, just going, man, you know, if there was just a bridge or something to get me out of here, there might be something better out there. I know people who I grew up with who just, you know, fell in the grips of whatever, you know, mental illness, addiction, you know. We let them sleep in our trucks when it's cold out. Finding a year-round place is really tough. 
I used to live in my mom's basement. I've used to, lived in a tent. I think there's a leniency our parents shared collectively that was kind of like, you're safe on the island. I think a lot of people don't leave and kind of see the way the rest of the world might work. What makes this place special isn't the geography, it's not the water, it's not the trees or the rocks, it's the people that live here. It's a little old fashioned that we all kind of look out for each other. But like you know, the island's got a huge heroin problem, right? Guy, guy died on a road last year, heroin. Who? What? I was doing like 30 perk 30s a day, and eventually, it just, all my friends were doing heroin. Literally, my life was contained in a space of like this big. It was my spoon, my drug, and my needle. And that was like it. And pretty soon, it's the only thing you know. The island and its people are shaped by its geography, insularity, rural character, and seasonal economy. Research on addiction shows a person's biology has a lot to do with how substances affect them, but so does their community. Often, a person doesn't know how susceptible they'll be to addiction until it's too late. But a community can decide how susceptible it allows its members to be. A community decides whether it prevents addiction or tolerates it. On island, it seems there's always been a contradictory sense of community and isolation, togetherness and loneliness. Looking in all directions, one is reminded of the powerful force of solitude. Going to a basketball game at the island's single high school, you're likely to see anyone, whether they're a teacher, parent, student, or a business owner volunteering to keep score. My job for me, it's all about connection. And if you can make a solid connection with somebody, so again, if and when they are ready to make a change in their life, they know that they, they can reach out, that's what's the most important thing. There's that, I mean, there's also tragedies that's gonna happen, but for kids who wanna make a change or young people that wanna make a change, there's a lot of support out here. There's an expectation that kids party in high school. I just think it's not shocking to people, and maybe that's always been the case, but I do think that there is just a shrug of your shoulders, like, oh, yeah, that's, they're in high school, what do you expect? Um, and I just think the needle has moved in terms of what's accepted and what's, ex what's considered extreme behavior and concerning behavior versus what's considered the norm. It sometimes feels as if we're swimming upstream by taking a hard stand against it, certainly in the building. We're so secluded from the world during the winter, and then during the summer, the whole world comes, and in the world, there's a, it, hit all, it all hits you at once in the summer, like everything is offered up to you, so. I think we use more drugs in winter because we have nothing to do. Yeah. We literally sure. have nothing to do. We have school, and then we get out of school at two, and then some people work, some people don't. All the cool places, like, where normally people would, like, go out in the summer and hang out, they're like closed down. The vineyard comes alive in the summer with restaurants and catering and nannying and retail shops. And so you could start working in a kitchen or a restaurant at 14 and you're working with, you know, wait staff who are anywhere between the ages of 18, 26, 30. Our students are have easy access to drugs and alcohol at an early age. Yeah, you're my neighbor, Franklin Street. I live next to Dave. I think most of us feel comfortable with the lines that we've drawn about what's acceptable and not acceptable in the high school. You can be an enforcer one day and then the next day when you're welcoming a student back you have to be the support. I think the hard part about living on an island is that every single decision you make is publicly debated out there about whether it was too hard or too soft or consistent or not consistent. And I think that public scrutiny um, can make it challenging to create a culture that's um, fair and consistent. On an island with no college, many struggle with what to do upon entering adulthood. Spencer began using cocaine, prescription pills, and heroin before graduating from Martha's Vineyard Regional High School five years ago. Spencer entered into recovery 
three years ago. Yeah. Stop meeting thing in my bar. Oh fuck. Uh, I just did. I did my fifth. It was a sixth, seventh, and eighth now. Oh, that's what's up. No, I don't think I'm gonna be able to make it. Why? I mean, why? Uh, you know, it all it all just started smoking pot and um, you know chasing that next weekend that um, you know that I could drink and just you know let loose with a couple friends or whatever happened and uh, and you know everything obviously escalated. Spencer is open about his recovery. <laughs> it's a process, and he's working through it. I didn't realize it at first, but like my mom was. Like, she obviously knew what was going on, but she just didn't want anything to do with it, you know? And it was, uh, like, it took me a while to realize that, like, I had gotten exactly what I wanted and more. Like, nobody was there to tell me that, you know, my life is out of control, I'm gonna die, you know? Uh, you know, I, I, had all the time to figure it out all by myself that I couldn't keep doing what I was doing. And, um, you know, I remember every busted needle that I had to jam through my fucking skin. I remember every time my fucking last needle got clogged up at two in the morning and I'd be sitting there fucking pushing on the back of the plunger because if I couldn't get that clogged blood out of that needle, then I wasn't going to be able to do anything unless I could find a needle somewhere else. And, you know, every time I shot myself in the face with my own fucking blood trying to get the fucking, trying to get the, uh, the blood out, like, you know, I don't know. I'm getting, I'm getting kind of, kind of skewed. If you got any more questions. Staying clean isn't just, you know, not using drugs. It's, uh, it's changing the way that I think about you, I think about me, I react to you, I react to me. Like, the way that I operate is not normal, you know? The way that I believe that other people see me is not normal. You know, it's not, it's not right to, like, try and like pocket all that stuff like you don't want to deal with it so like everything just goes away you know because you don't know, like when you use out of boredom when you use out of you know like depression like you don't just put that depression away you don't just put that boredom away you put your um your grief away you put your happiness away you know you're content you know uh you know everything everything goes down you know and um you're just like left as like a shell of your former self. First responders, like Tracy, are early adopters of change, like distributing Narcan, a drug that reverses the effects of a narcotics overdose, or advocating for the Good Samaritan Act, which provides immunity to witnesses of an overdose. We go to the grocery store and we'll see patients that we've taken in and they say thank you. And, you know, it's hard from a staff standpoint because you can have a, somebody come up to you and say thank you so much for taking care of my father and you're like, oh, you're more than welcome, but you don't really know who they are because it was something that happened six months ago and you've had multiple calls since then. And so you're like, but um, yeah, the staff get appreciated very much so by the community. It's been hard because it's been such a transition, the community going from being an ambulance driver to bringing the hospital to the patient. That's been the biggest transformation that I've seen over the last 10 years. We have, you know, having a motor vehicle accident from somebody who's run off the road because they have an altered mental status and they have been using drugs, and then arriving and your patient's actively seizing. Things like that can be extremely stressful on the staff because you go from a substance abuse call to a seizure call, and you have to think on the fly. You have to, you know, what's the cause of the seizure? So then you have to treat the overdose. 
and then stop the seizure as a secondary. Um, that can be kind of stressful, especially when you pull up and you know the vehicle and you know who's behind the driver's seat. And um, it's happened on occasion where we've had staff that go, oh my God, this is somebody I know. Over the years, there have been several fatal drunk driving accidents on Martha's Vineyard. The effects of these tragedies have been long lasting and are not forgotten. It's kind of rare for people to have this like sense of community. And it feels amazing to be in a position where I can hopefully give back to the island that supported me through quite a bit, through, through good and through bad. Kelly's story is a lightning rod on island. As a senior, she was the driver in an accident that killed her best friend. Today, her life's focus is helping those in early recovery while maintaining her own sobriety. It was the most life-changing moment of my life. I was a senior in high school at the time, 17. My friend Jenna was a grade above me. Graduation was a few days away, and Jenna had come home for the summer, and a group of us were celebrating the end of the year. We had left and went to do something, and then on the drive back, it was kind of a sleek night, rainy, the weather wasn't great, and I went to pass two cars at like a very high speed. And when I went to come back in, I like lost control. And it was the passenger side of my car that got like the impact of the hit. And I learned after the fact that uh, Jenna passed pretty much instantly, like she didn't get taken to the hospital off island. And it took me a while to kind of grasp everything that had happened. My main injury was um, a brain injury. You didn't know what day it was, and you didn't know what year it was, and you didn't know where you were, but we were there together. And I felt like I couldn't ask for any more than that at that moment. That's, that's all I needed. From that moment on, Everything was different, and we grew closer and closer together. Like, who would have thought from all of that, all of this would come? And it didn't come easily, but you did it. For the most part, the island has come to terms with the fatal accident, but the process has been long and painful. Kelly still hopes for forgiveness from the parents of her late friend. Michael Blanchard found that he had an abundance of time after seeking treatment for alcoholism. He picked up photography while in recovery, and today it's his career and life's calling. He opened a gallery in 2017. I had a woman come in here and asked me what was my favorite photograph of all time. And I decided to tell this story to a bunch of fifth graders over at Edgartown School. So I brought the photograph in and it's a bird sitting on a beach. A woman said, I can't believe that that's your, your favorite photo out of all of these that you have here. And she said, why? And I said, because look, the only thing that's in focus is the bird and the sand at its feet. The, the waves are blue, they look beautiful, but everything else is blurry. I said, I took this picture when I just got back from, uh, from going to rehab for three months, and it represents to me starting over. I can only, at least I have me in the sand at my feet. I don't know what else is gonna happen, but I'd never even had that before. So I looked at the fifth graders and I said, you know what, the woman came back two hours later and she bought the photo. And I said, why do you think she bought the photo? And some little kid raises his hand, he said, maybe there was a time in her life when she was starting over too. Some kid says, how did you get to be a photographer? I said, well, I got in trouble with alcohol. And somehow by total chance, I found photography and it saved me. 
I would look out through the window and say, look at those clouds, look at, you know, I gotta get my camera. Suddenly the evening became a place of excitement instead of dread. Then a kid said, how did it feel when you told everybody you were an alcoholic? And I said, it felt like the weight of the world was taken off my shoulders because I didn't have to hide who I was anymore and it made all the difference in my life. I went in to talk about how they could make their photos of trash more effective. They were trying to get plastics off the island and I ended up leaving, I think, making a connection with them that, that I would like to reestablish with other classes. It was a really meaningful um, experience for me. And as a recovering alcoholic, it also reinforces me because my disease doesn't go away. is unlike anywhere I've ever been. That's why I came back. But there is kind of a darkness of this place. As beautiful as it is, there's a lot of tortured souls that live out here. The network of support at Tabor Tree includes employees Riley and Tyler, their roommates, with Riley handing down his knowledge of recovery. Most of us are the product of, you know, the hippie generation. We're all the kids of outcasts and misfits who came here to escape, you know, normal society and then they all had kids we all you know fell in that same gene pool most of us have some type of issue be it mental illness substance use disorder what have you and it made it easy to you know most most people um started experimenting at an early age and you know you go to the high school here and it's kind of like uh like a rite of passage also being here you know you are stuck My boss is an interesting character. He is like, I would say, definitely a pillar in the, in the recovery community. He's at the morning meeting every single day. He lost everything he built through using. But in the last 10 years, he's built his company back up. And one of the things that he does to give back is he hires people in recovery. He felt that tree work was an outlet for him watching the people come in and out and, and falling in love with the work because you know I really take solace in the trees. Like that's one of my main things that keeps me clean is uh, is climbing, you know. Like I said, it's a moving meditation, you know, you are just present at where you're at. And uh, it's a great feeling. Getting up and, and knowing that your work, you love your work and you have something to do and a purpose every day. You know, you get a real sense of accomplishment in this line of line of work. Recovery can feel like climbing out of a deep hole, but one without level ground up above. Instead, you'll remain suspended as you rise, like Riley suspended in these trees. You'll feel the warmth of the sun, the fresh air, the clarity of a new perspective, but you'll always be at risk for falling back. This is why Riley climbs with ropes and a spotter, and why recovery can be so much safer with support. When I get in that tree, it's like there's nothing that you could think of besides that tree. I hate heights, so I'm like up in this tree, I'm like, oh man, it's, it's uncomfortable, but it like makes you focus. You can like see the progress and like feel good after. It gives you that instant gratification, you know, that you would get from a substance. Our understanding of substance use disorders and the stigma around them is changing. Alcohol use and opioid use carry very different stigma, but both can be treated with similar methods. Changing just the way we talk about disorders can go a long way. 
as well as aligning groups of on-island organizations, including the police departments, increasing awareness of substance use disorders, and creating advocates for proactive treatment. Karen Casper is central to new initiatives that can really help. When you take things, they affect your brain chemistry. And for some people, it maybe doesn't affect their brain chemistry as dramatically as other people. Whatever the substance is, it's when you start craving that medication and develop tolerance, is that, that is when it starts to kind of take control of your life. I mean, that's how we define addiction. I'd love to see a world where we didn't have this, but it's like imagining a world without illness. How can we keep people from dying? How can we be realistically have a good conversation that this is a medical illness? And how can we try to help people that are going through this? Because you never know who's gonna have that response. Another room. I, I'm not gonna just sit back and accept that. Like, that's not okay with me. I always hold on to, let's keep trying, let's, keep doing something. First it was getting the police departments in a lock zone. You know, then it was developing connections with all the other resources on the island and talking to one another. And then now it's like really about getting people into treatment. You know, it's, it's heart-wrenching. I mean, it's terrible. It's terrible when you're having to tell a family of a person that's overdosed multiple times that this time you couldn't save them. It's, there's nothing worse. Accepting the premise that substance use disorder is a disease reveals a reality that many are afraid to face. It's the reality that we are not treating our sick, that there are people in need all around us, in all of our families, and that they're often ignored and hiding simply due to stigma, something that can be dispelled simply by acknowledging reality. This is a disease that it really does touch like all of us. It's a disease that we have to we have to recognize and we have to work together and we have to realize that, you know, it's just, it's a disease. <laughs> we gotta take care of people. Some struggling islanders find support from their employers. Dennis Redican of Tabor Tree is known as the street sweeper because he supports people close to bottoming out, keeping them off the streets. One of his employees, Joey Jones, overdosed fatally in August of 2018. David Jones, a master carpenter, was Joey's brother. He had climbed up into his work truck so that he would be ready to go Monday morning and uh, probably tried to get high one last time before going to bed. And the way they made it sound is that he just went to sleep and just didn't wake up. He did a big service, got to play with his band. It was my first time playing uh, playing any guitar live. and still one of the ways I find I get closest to him is when I'm playing music. My dad and my brother-in-law and I ended up uh, making a casket for him um, in here. I don't know what we were thinking when we did it. I'm glad we did it now, but it was stressful at the time. But it gave me something to plug into, and I was basically just obsessed with that and worked on that all that morning and night. It's, you know, it's the kind of thing you, you, you hear about. And I mean, I've had so many of my friends or people in my life that I've known that have passed because of addiction, um, because of substance use. Addiction will get you, it traps you, and you don't know there's a way out, you know? Talking about the differences between the summer and the winter here, it's kind of the same Jekyll and Hyde thing where they're two different people when they're using and uh, under the influence and when they're sober and straight. Um, I mean, there's so many beautiful things happening from people that are just directing that energy now into their sobriety or these community and these great projects, you know. Twenty-seven. Yep. Too soon. Miss him. Joey is more than just an overdose statistic. He is deeply missed. 
His family feels strongly that stories like his should be talked about openly, without shame, without stigma. Whether you realize it or not, across the island you'll find people who have had experiences with substance use disorder that have changed the course of their lives. They now live sober, often engaged in recovery programs to help others. Larkin Stallings, owner of the popular dive bar and venue The Ritz, is among them. It is odd having a guy like me own the Ritz, right? Because, uh, yeah, I don't drink, right? I'm open about it. I'm not, I mean, I should be anonymous, right? I'm not, I don't care. I mean, it's, I've been doing this for so long that it's like, uh, it's part of who I am. After I opened the, uh, the Ritz and it was like, okay, where do I fit in this community? What can I do that's, that's beyond running this bar on Circuit Avenue, right? And I was invited by Victor, who's my next door neighbor, to, uh, to join the Board of Community Services. What we have is this, this group of folks that are doing, doing the work of helping the folks, creating the safety net and health and human services on this island uh, in a way that's, that's pretty powerful and cool. Community services is interesting because it has everything from, it's really from, from early childhood development to elder care and everything in between. And a big piece of it is substance use disorder. A big piece of it is, is, uh, is mental health. Uh, I don't think the island really knows what's available to them for free. It is incredibly difficult to see someone you love suffer through addiction, even those far along in the recovery journey relapse, some over and over. Relapsing is painful, but it is not a reset. It is not a total loss of progress. It is, in fact, part of the process. It's important we support each other through that process. Treating the most vulnerable with love and empathy protects our loved ones from descending further into isolation and depression. I've learned that like love is unconditional, like, and you have to be honest. That's one thing I always lacked in other relationships. It was either I was getting cheated on or someone was lying about something and it was heartbreaking. Like love isn't something that you just feel. Brianna and Spencer met during recovery. In this case, they were not allowed to date each other while living in the same recovery house. But Brianna and Spencer felt their bond was so promising that they immediately connected after they left the home got back to the house and actually the um, the restaurant like sent me a confirmation text <laughs> yeah it was very fancy <laughs> I've never never had a restaurant reservation personally ever By nah hell no you serious That's what I mean, like, reservations yeah I'm like, oh, I would never go out to eat at a restaurant in general Oh, I know. Yeah. Little Debbie's. Yeah, exactly. <laughs> that was it. <laughs> I came down here and for like two months straight, stayed in my dad's house. I didn't want friends. I was done. Like, I was at the point where it's like, I had finally got myself back. My sponsor, Kelly, was like, you should come to a meeting tonight. So she picks me up and we walk into this meeting. The meeting happened and at the end I was outside smoking a cigarette. And this kid walks over and he's like, hi, I'm Spencer. And I was like, cool. My sponsor's like, oh, you wanna come to this thing? It's like Fellowship Friday, it's really good. Like, you'll meet everybody. We ended up going to a meeting after and he sat down next to me again. And like, I went to go leave and I was hugging everybody goodbye and I'm like, I guess I have to hug you too. And he was like, I guess. So we like hugged each other. We became like friends. He asked me if I wanted to hang out and I was like, okay, I had no friends. Like, of course I'll hang out, even though I didn't want any. And um, he brought me to like a beach and we just talked for hours. And I was like, this is fucking weird. Like I've never been able to just talk to somebody sober and laugh, like we laughed like idiots. But I really like Ozark. Yeah. A lot. That's, uh, that's probably one of the better shows that you've started watching. Well, yeah, because I can actually get you to watch it with me now. <laughs> I know. As long as it's not Haven or Ruby. It was like a little while after I was in the sober house, and one day I texted him, and I was like, you know, I'm getting really close to you, and like, I don't want to lose you. And I go, I know we can't make it official because we live in a sober house, and now it's against the rules to even be hanging out with each other. I'm like, but 
I like, I really care and like, I don't want you just running off and not wanting to talk to me anymore. Like, if you're gonna stick around, you need to tell me. And his words to me were, don't worry, I love you too, Brianna. Summer on Martha's Vineyard is finally here. This film was shot in two trips, one in the winter of 2020 and one in the summer. Between those shoots, there was a global pandemic. Although there are fewer visitors this year because of COVID-19, tourists still arrive to enjoy the beaches and the seafood, to get away from the repeating chain restaurants of the mainland, to experience the meditative remoteness of the island for themselves. Winter's up for me here, you know, cold, Few people around, dead. Go to the bar, same people every night. So you got one bar during the winter? Are you kidding me? Get the hell out of here, you know? Like I heard they got 5,000 new residents, you know, new homeowners. I feel like the diversity, like, shoots skyrockets. Even in the winter, it's a lot of Brazilians and Jamaicans, and you know, so it's very diverse as it is. Uh, definitely, you'll meet people here that you'll remember for the rest of your life. We did hear that it was a lot more crowded this past weekend, so they're kind of like off-season to explore places. We don't really like big crowds. Especially as with COVID going on, you know. It's kind of casual and chill and, like you said, diverse. Which is like... Yeah, it has a beach. Yeah, it has a beach. Good seafood. The best seafood. It's different because there's no, there's no McDonald's, there's no Chick-fil-A or whatever. The rest of my time here definitely will be drinking. Beaching, uh, doing a lot of shopping. Yes, shopping for sure. The one of the most popular one, the jumping of the bridge, jaw t-shirt. Say like five, six a day. Beautiful summer. Not good in the winter. There was definitely a lot more depression, a lot more anxiety initially when COVID first hit. With the substance abuse on the island, we've seen more, um, we've seen a, a slight increase initially. And I think a lot of that had to do with the isolation. The recovery programs on the island, it's been tough because everything shut down. People were relying heavily on their sponsors. There's definitely been a lot more people that have had to seek long-term treatment because of the isolation. We've had overdoses, but it wasn't like a huge amount more, and I, I still worry. Part of recovery is you can have relapse. Relapse and recovery go hand in hand, so the hope is to have more days in recovery than in relapse. And what I've seen is due to this community, our community efforts, people come, if they do come back, they're even more supported when something happens. I'm starting to now ask a patient, you know, do you have a recovery coach? And I'm getting a lot of yeses. It's not one fit for everybody. You know, it's not, someone may do better with medication, somebody may do better with a support group. It's, it's nice to have so many different options. It's a natural thing to look for comfort wherever you can find it. And drugs are an easy place to find it. What really helps people not use is a sense of connection. I have a Suboxone support group where uh, everybody is on Suboxone. Some of those people feel a lot of stigma. Uh, but you look around the room, this is a room full of sober people. And you, you can look at them and you can see these are healthy, People, the group becomes like a family and there's a sense of togetherness. People need to do the work in therapy, in 12-step meetings, with recovery coaches, with their families. It's really important that we protect people's privacy. Uh, and, and I think that on a small island, that's one of our biggest challenges because I think that the person has to drive their care. You know, we talk about stigma. You have to realize they're human beings. They have illnesses like any other illness. It's not a moral fallacy. It's not a shortcoming. It's not a, you know, it's, it's something that education is important to understand that. There's a sense that we're kind of all in this together. If a kid 
dies in a car accident on the island, everybody knows it before it's in the paper. And the question is, why is that true here? I think it's a few things. One is that there's a sense of being an islander. There's a sense that our lives are connected. The lives of vineyarders are completely intertwined, and as fast as word spreads, so does support. Perhaps it's not about keeping struggles a secret, but being thoughtful about how we speak about them. I had a first attempt at sobriety in my late 30s, and that's when I got into yoga. And it was Bikram yoga, it was hot yoga, and I did it obsessively twice a day, like I do everything. I was what they call white knuckling it. You know, I was sober, but I was like a dry drunk. Um, I didn't have any tools for coping. I crashed and burned, my second marriage was destroyed. I was having a lot of problems with general with relationships, with just living, but yet I was highly functioning. But there was a big dark secret and it was ruining my life. So I got sober, it was really hard. Then a year in, again a year in, I realized I needed help, I needed support. There was a copy of the local newspaper, the Martha's Vineyard Times, right next to me in the car. And it happened to be on the page where the meetings were listed and so I went to a meeting. And it was a very good experience, and I basically like cried for weeks, the first few weeks of those particular meetings. Eventually, I, you know, I slipped again, came back in, did that a couple times. Um, in a way, even though that's happened to me, and some people get it from day one and they never leave the program, um, it's given me a lot of compassion. I didn't realize how complex and how, you know, what a baffling disease this is. It's very difficult to hide it. But I think what people find here on the island is everybody knows anyway. <laughs> it's not really a secret. Most people have already figured it out. And also, when you fess up, so to speak, you get mainly, like I say, when I walked into that first AA meeting, you actually get like encouragement and love. The stigma associated with substance use disorder can prevent people from seeking help and treatment, but it can also prevent them from seeking practical materials like the life-saving drug Narcan, a nasal spray that can reverse the effects of an opioid overdose in minutes. So I, I, uh, I save bags and then I make them up with um, a, a naloxone kit, which is, you know, commonly called, called Narcan. And there is a little handy-dandy check for overdose um, and quick how to do it. And so what we can do is let people know how much we care by here, we want you to stay alive. Here's how to use it. Sure, let me know where to drop it off. No problem. Here's other places you can get it. Because although there, everyone can get naloxone on their Dr. Wally prescription in Massachusetts, you can walk into any pharmacy and ask for it. From what I know and, and from my work doing that, the people who need it the most are the ones that are less likely to walk in. With the prohibitive cost, if you don't have some kind of prescription coverage, um, it, it makes us handing this out so much more important. Probably everyone I know who I deliver to is also known by name in whatever pharmacy they would be going in to get it. It's more the person's feeling of guilt and shame and stigma that keeps them from going in to get the naloxone, even if they can't afford it. And it also is part of the reason why people don't go to detox, is that 
Oh, but now every, the cat's gonna be out of the bag, you know? It's from the sober house back into the enclave of people who are also using. There's no mechanism or there's no place where there can be that sort of midway. Living like that will produce a mental illness as well. I know I'm not doing the right thing for myself, but I'm going to over and over and over and over again. To, to be able to um, reach in there somehow and somehow find a way of accessing that person's life force. The first thing I say is I'm glad you're back. I'm really glad you're back. Do you still have your job? How, how does it feel to be back at work? How are you sleeping? Do you need anything? You don't have to do this alone. We're, we're right here with you. I think you did a good job getting back and you know, having a little lapse or a relapse is often part of recovery. And it's often part of what you need to learn so that you can have the freedom of living substance free. Michelle delivers Narcan to those in need on her bicycle. Because the island is so small, she's worried that people will see her car and associate it with Narcan, revealing the places where people in active addiction are cohabitating. She rides her bike and delivers the life-saving drug in a brown bag as a measure to protect the privacy of the people she serves. Michelle is 73. When I was about 15 years old, I started drinking alcohol. It was always guzzle a, a bottle of gin. You know, I was always trying to escape. I was lucky to uh, land here on Martha's Vineyard. I met my first husband in 1967. He turned me on to intravenous drugs. So we left the island and uh, ended up getting married. Bought 40 acres of land up in New Hampshire. Just wanted to live the wholesome life. After a couple of years of that, I guess the drugs were really calling to me. I just wanted to come back to Martha's Vineyard. Became a waitress. I discovered alcohol again. Or after being into heavy drugs, alcohol just seemed like a good decision at that time. I was dual addicted. I'd do the coke and I'd have to keep drinking. I had a dream. I dreamt that I was just getting high. I just wanted to get high and I OD'd. And I, and I got the connection that every time I put a drug into my body, I could kill myself. And that wasn't my intention. When I was 28 years old, I got addicted to surf casting. The minute I get out and I'm standing in the surf, it's like I feel like I hold my breath all winter and I exhale. It's my communion with my higher power. I feel like I'm the person I'm meant to be. There was times when I couldn't fish, and when I couldn't fish, I knew something was wrong. I started to get suspicious. It's like, you know what? I don't even feel like fishing. There's something wrong with my life, but I didn't know what it was. Well, now I was in my 50s. Thought about picking up heroin again, so I made an appointment with Dr. Silberstein and I crawled into his office. That was almost uh, 14, 15 years ago. I took the Suboxone, never had a craving since, and uh, my life flourished. Started a guiding business. I wrote a book. I became an author. I think I'm a miracle and I'm a very grateful human being. So we're standing here with a camera, right? I would have never known, I would never known this before. I've never done anything like this before. 
But if you could tell people that you could sit here and you could experience all this stuff and you don't have to have any drugs or alcohol in your system, I would have never believed that. You're here quiet, there's nothing else, and then you can just feel an energy. Every two or three minutes, the whole thing changes. And sometimes I'll sit here for two hours and it'll look like I've just taken pictures over like an eight week period. Well, somebody said it in a gallery yesterday, they said, don't you ever get tired of taking pictures of the same things on Martha's Vineyard? And I said, I'm not taking pictures of things. I'm taking pictures of the light that bounces off the things. It, it goes beyond addiction. There are people that are like right now with COVID and the whole pandemic situation, there are so many people that are coming in that just don't see there's an end. And if I can take some really cool pictures that people can't even imagine because they're asleep, and I can post something out there and they can see this the clarity coming through the fog and if I can come up with the words that are eloquent enough or moving enough that and I attach it to that photograph it's like magical the fog and the sun are always a constant theme for me because you can't see beyond those trees right there and so if you're heading in that direction you got to have faith and I always used to say if you have yourself you have your feet planted on the sand and you're, you're, you've got yourself that, and you know you're, you're following your heart that you can't see beyond that corner but you know you're heading in the right direction and you just have to have faith to keep going and, and eventually the fog will clear and you'll get a beautiful sunrise. Just before our crew returned to the island, Spencer relapsed. With the support of Brianna and the tight-knit recovery community of Martha's Vineyard, Spencer's time in relapse was brief, and now he's back in recovery. I have bought in a car, moved for three times, three, four times. Me, my dad, and Spencer all moved into this apartment that I was like, when you see it, it's gonna be awesome, like, you're gonna love it, and it was a lot smaller than I remembered. <laughs> so everything's been really good. I've been working 10 times more. I've noticed myself overworking. I've noticed it like take a toll on me in like a sense where I can't go to as many meetings or I can't actually have time for myself. I got 18 months clean last week, having like a normal job that's stable and I get to spend time with my family every day. Like it's, it means a lot. So when the whole pandemic happened, I thought that like it would get slower and people, it wouldn't be as busy and like everyone decided to come here. <laughs> I don't know why. So my boyfriend relapsed about three weeks ago. Like I knew it, I knew it for at least a week, but like didn't want to believe it. My dad kept telling me, he's like, you need to remember how you'd want someone to treat you if you relapsed. It made me sick to see him like that. He was home for like a week. I drug tested him every other day. So we waited another week until the sober house would take him. And he finally got in last Wednesday. I thought that with everything going good, like I never pictured him relapsing or like, I mean, I pictured if anything, it being me. And like, I don't want anything to do with drugs. I didn't want to ever see it again and let alone think that it'd be brought in my face, in my house. I didn't really like relapse the way that I would have normally. It wasn't like I had to stop. Like it wasn't like I almost died. It wasn't like going to court or, you know, the police or my family. It was just like not, um, not wanting to do all that. I more or less have to drop everything that I think I know about staying clean and I have to be willing to kind of do it from scratch. Relapse is totally a part of recovery, you know. Um, Brianna couldn't have 
you know, showed me more that she didn't think that it was gonna happen. What's important to me now is just putting my relapse behind me and not, not forgetting it, acknowledging it, but being able to move forward. I can only be sure of what I'm doing right now. I can't do it for anybody else. I need to learn how to do things for myself. Like in five years, I would think that I'm still with Brianna and uh, you know, I would have started a family with her by then. I think for me and Spencer, as long as he stays on the right path and like I do, like I want a family. I want to have somewhat of a normal life. You know, I mean really basic. <laughs> If you really want to like uh, think about it, you know, nothing crazy. Um, you know, I guess what anybody else would have really wanted. Uh, but it's, I don't know. I have hope for the future. I just hope that it actually follows along, I guess. If I didn't love him, I wouldn't still be here. But I love him and I know he can do it and I know he loves me, and I think that we're gonna have a good relationship. We just need to get through obstacles that everybody else goes through. <laughs>
there's hope that we can cross this ocean that separates us from one another. This is all to say something very simple, something very familiar, but something those who are struggling need to hear. I just love you. And what is it, how is it that that, that love can reach you? The subjects in this film depend on the community members that have dedicated their lives to supporting OUD and SUD recovery efforts. But like what we have today from where we were in 2015, 2016 is extraordinary. Dude, there are 50 trained coaches right. on this island. Recovery coaches like Brian Morris and Eric Adams work on island to support those who are struggling and in need of help. Some police departments on island have even teamed up with recovery coaches to better handle situations. 
on the on the vineyard here, we we have a lot of alcohol abuse. Um, Try calling that party back. Uh, other substances that need addressing as well. And Chief McNamee was was fully behind me in uh, pursuing all substance use. Jen Maxner, who is affectionately known as Max, is also working at the Vineyard House, a recovery residence serving Martha's Vineyard. I'm really grateful. I'm grateful that I can be a part of the recovery on Martha's Vineyard. Benita Doble, Riley's wife, and Kelly work together at the Recovery House. The Red House is a daytime peer recovery and support center available to residents on island. And it basically is a peer-to-peer -peer model. So um, it's people that are not like in treatment or clinical, or you know, we're not psychiatrists or psychologists. We're just people that have been through the same stuff as anyone who's gonna be, through, be coming through the door. A big part of what makes recovery possible on Martha's Vineyard is the public servants and health officials advocating for change to the way we think about those who are suffering from substance use disorder. We've got new paths, we've got AA, we've got NA, we've got um, sober house, we've got counseling services, we've got recovery coaches. So for each substance, I think people have to, we have to work with them where they are. But the most important thing is that we connect with them. Brian has dedicated his life to supporting others after entering recovery himself. This horse taught me that um, being accountable to something or somebody other than my bad habits might save my life. I just assumed I was going back to New York. And I was told in no uncertain terms I was not wanted back there. So I ended up here, good friends, who own that horse, said, Brian, as long as you're in a program, as long as you're going to meetings, as long as you're staying sober, oh, and by the way, as long as you muck out the stalls of our horses, Merlin and Star, every morning at 5 a.m., and every evening at 9 p.m., all will be well. For three years, that's what I did. And at the time, I didn't realize it, but I do now. Those were the best three years of my life. Got me back on track. Become a part of the grassroots movement to reduce substance misuse and destigmatize addiction on Martha's Vineyard. Please consider making a donation today at onislandmv.org. Together, we can create an island where no one is alone.